We come now to what may well be the most important step for us all to take in controlling our conscious thought process. Setting ideals. Most of us assume that we are rational human beings who do a certain amount of creative thinking. What we call thinking is generally a set of responses to stimuli. As George J. Nathan, the famous 1930s critic, once said, a matter of rearranging prejudices. To discover just how brilliant our thinking is requires only a brief playback of an average day's conversations on weather, a rough day at the office or home, or politics. The hackneyed phrase we are creatures of habit is all too true. Recall for a moment how you last answered the telephone, which television show you turned on, what you said when someone asked, how are you? Or what you said when a friend asked you what you thought of the new minister. The habits of our bodies reflect strong habits of the mind. Many of these patterns make up our fears, although we rarely think of them in this connection. For example, have you ever said, I am afraid it's going to rain? Or, oh, I am afraid I can't do that? Or, I don't like Frenchmen, Republicans, cops, homosexuals, Indians, or wasps. Or, I've got to make a change? Or, our society is in a mess? You can go on and on with these phrases. Behind them, you can frequently find patterns of prejudice, self-pity, doubt, or other negative emotions, which are breeding grounds for fear. The following extract is a good illustration of how we subtly and repetitiously create fear patterns. For a 53-year-old mother, Edgar Cayce gave the following reading. How, ye ask, is this applicable in the experience of this entity now known as or called 793? That will, that fear of what may become a part of the experience is such in the experience of the entity, that so oft does it find, and has it found this very condition preventing self from enjoying even its greater joys. For so oft is the attitude, yes. But tomorrow is a change. Yes. But can that be true for me? Yes. But I have not accomplished that which is my ideal. Yes but I have fallen short of that as I would do. Yes. But they will soon be grown, thinking their own thoughts, going their own ways. And the entity has let so much of this interfere with and prevent the real joy of the beauties, the joy, the wonderful grace that has ever been and is so near to each soul, that seeks to know his face. Many Edgar Cayce readings give admonitions to set ideals. Physically, mentally, spiritually. As one would expect, the suggestions vary for different people. However, the purpose, method, and importance of setting ideals are clear. Then the more reason the entity should be very sure within self of its ideals. Spiritual, mental, material. And most of all, the entity should budget itself, its time. Recuperate in body, in mind, in purpose, in hopes. Then, so much time should be spent in work, in labor. So much time in recreation. Yea, so much time in beautifying the body. To another person, Edgar Cayce said, analyze self and the purposes, the motives, the influences. And know that they agree with that which is thy ideal. What is thy ideal? Spiritually, mentally, physically? Not what you would wish God to do for you, but what may you do in appreciation of the love shown. Not as to what ye would like to be, but what may ye mentally give that will be conducive to constructive thinking in the experience of others. In the physical, not what you want others to do for you, but what may you do for them. These are what we mean by constructive thinking, and as they are applied within the experience, we will come to see what a spiritual life means. Not eliminating of pleasures, for the purpose of life is pleasure, but that which is constructive and not destructive. For this 17-year-old girl, the reading was very specific. Know that ye are in the earth as an opportunity for self, for social unfoldment, 
and in the relationships with thy companions of both thine own sex and the opposite sex, you should not be merely an idealist, but so live, not necessarily what is called a puritanic life, but so live that others, all others would wish to be like you. That is an ideal manner of conduct. What is required in this? In self-knowing thine own ideals, spiritually, mentally, materially, not merely as, I think this should be it, I think that would be wonderful, but write them down. And see what they look like. You'll be surprised how oft you can change them from one day to another. Then knowing the ideal, practice it. Don't have an ideal and then not practice it daily in thy activities. To a 36-year-old woman, K.C. expressed the importance of setting ideals thus. As indicated, first analyze self. Know thy ideal. Spiritual, mental, material. Then so apply self in those directions as never to condemn another, never to be in that position of holding a grudge or holding any of those things that make people afraid. For as ye have ever been in that position of aid to those not understanding, then do not become as one giving too much of judgments without the passing judgment on self. For another woman about the same age, Edgar Cayce explained the importance of the ideal as related to worry, which he defined as a kind of fear. One that is at times easily worried at material things. One that at times worries as respecting the application others make of their abilities. In the matter of worry, this in its last analysis, is that of fear. Fear is an enemy to the mental development of an entity, changing or wavering the abilities of an entity in many directions. Find that this is the answer ever for self, as to an ideal to be worked toward, to be used at all times, to be learned upon in adversity and in criticism, in successes, in failures, in pleasures, in hardships, in adversity and in those conditions that are as entanglements of the mental or physical being. How can you put ideals on paper so that you can review them and gradually change and upgrade them? The following format shows two possible methods. Each has advantages. Use the one that is easiest for you. If you are serious about working with your own fears, do not neglect this exercise. This is a simple approach to setting ideals. Put your physical, mental, and spiritual ideals down in words and phrases in each column. Check your thoughts, words, and actions against these words and phrases in each column. Review and revise weekly or monthly. Here is a more complicated form. Divide up your daily activities according to your emphasis on them, time and energy spent in your life. Such as home, work, and friends. Now put in words in each circle physical, mental, and spiritual related to your ideals for each part of your life. Review frequently and change them as you grow. Building a fear-free, constructive life. The following seven suggestions, including some detailed techniques, can help you build a fear-free, constructive life. Constructive thought. Using the mind to influence the body. Systematic control of thought. Use of inspirational reading. Your dreams will help you observe your real attitudes. Use suggestions for yourself and others just before sleep. Develop a sense of humor. Every step will strengthen and feed the thought forms that you build and thus will support your overall program of change. In all these approaches, the focus is on dealing with anxiety or fear symptoms directly in the present. Step 1. Constructive thought. Constructive attitudes are built of thoughts that are reactions to events in which you have been involved or to what you have heard, seen or read about a particular condition, person, situation, or group. We all constantly add to or modify our attitudes. Every time we think, speak, or act while holding a particular attitude, we strengthen or change it slightly. Consider personal attitudes related to fear. 
Every time we react negatively, we add to our negative thought patterns. We give the fear greater power. Every time we react positively we lessen the strength of the fear pattern as we face it. Review your habit patterns of speech. How often, when asked to do something, take part in an activity, and so on, do you say, I am afraid I can't do that, or I'll try, I'll consider that or even just plain no. Anything is better than I am afraid. Saying such things triggers all kinds of inhibitions. We must stop telling ourselves we are afraid. A personal experience may help clarify my approach to this suggestion. During World War II, our company lived in cold, damp barracks in England and colder, damper tents in France. I developed a series of colds and a sinus infection. On returning home, I talked continuously about my sinus condition. Friends soon learned not to ask me how I felt, for I would tell them in several thousand carefully selected words. I frequently remarked, I am afraid I am going to have another attack of sinus. One morning, I awoke from a dream of being smothered. I had to get up and walk in the yard at 5 o'clock in the morning in order to get my breath. I determined to give up my sinus, including the small polyps that had developed in my nose. I gave up the attitude toward my sinus condition and with it the difficulties I was having. Now I never say, I am afraid I am going to have an attack of sinus. The following Edgar Cayce readings may help us recognize the importance of constructive attitudes. Each was given for a person seeking help. What causes the entity to complain of ailments so often and are they real or imaginative? As is seen from that given, imaginative forces are manifested ever in the entity. But fear entering in brings for a physical being that which becomes as real as were they disordered. Hence the ideal in body, in mind, in attainment must be ever kept before the entity, and that the whole well-rounded life is necessary for the complete success in any phase of one's experience. There are abilities in abundance within the entity for activities, if they are put into use from the seat of the spirit of truth, and not from those of hate, malice, jealousy, the things that make people afraid, those things that cause timidity within the associations, and fear. Do not become impatient with self nor the lack of those materializations at once of those hopes in the body. Where it has taken years to produce a fear, a doubt, an activity that begins to find manifestation in the twitching of a muscle, in the expansion of a vein, in the frustrations in body forces. Be patient, be quiet within. And we will find those administrations that have been made. And that may be made. Will aid the in growing in the right directions. We are frequently unaware of how powerful our minds are as they build thought forms that take material expression in our lives. Also know that hate, jealousy, animosity, fear and the like create that environment, that animation, which, as it comes into material manifestation, brings doubt, heartaches, tears, disappointments. Oft one may question self as to why or as to how such and such could have come upon self with all the high-minded ideas that may be expressed. As has been indicated, that which we are indeed speaks so loud, seldom is there heard what we say. Other than of a creative and constructive nature. The following reference zeroes in on this point of view by suggesting a change of attitude. As we find, first there must be, if there would be helpful forces for this body the changes of the mental attitude toward self, toward general surroundings. There must be the holding to some general creative energies, for the body will gain much more by trying and in helping someone else, rather than pitying or excusing or condemning things in self or others. This matter of building constructive attitudes through daily thought control takes on a very practical note in the following extract. Will my insurance business continue to be a success? As known or viewed from the very activities of self, if there are to be continued the torments within self, 
the indecisions within self, the expectancy that disorders or disruptions will arise, these create those very influences in the contacts, in the groups, in the relations that are necessary in the activities. But, if there is shown faith, hope, understanding, cooperation in the activities, it will continue not only to be as the present but an increased success. For there is the spirit of valuation and protection, for those very ideals that self would build within self. Edgar Cayce frequently spoke of the importance of attitude for a balanced creative life. The following two comments were for a woman aged 25 and for a man aged 55. What phase of music should I study in order to derive the most benefit? That more of the nature which to thine own inner self creates harmonious vibrations in the experiences of self and those about thee. That partaking of the rhymes, the lullabies, the pastoral scenes, which make for such harmonious forces, bring quiet, cheer, hope and casting out fear. What causes the fears with which I am obsessed at the present time, and how can I overcome them? Only by changing the mental attitude. These arise, as just indicated, from the supersensitiveness of the whole body to environments and activities that have been about the body, see? Then, if the mental attitude is set much in that way and manner as may be best obtained from the 14th chapter of St. John, it would be the better. Read that before retiring. Read that when any fears come about. We will find a different attitude. And the following short selection serves as a summary. Keep hopeful. Keep those things about the body that make for the more cheerful reactions. For fear or doubt or disturbances to the mind, as it is sensitive in its activity, make for the greater hardships. Step 2. Using the mind to influence the body. The power of the mind to influence physical body functions results in what are called psychosomatic effects. For example, the hypochondriac who thinks he or she is sick may actually become sick. Bodily tissue can actually be altered by emotion lot and thought. Even before 1910, Edgar Cayce noted the disruption of function and the destruction of tissue by thought processes. Of even greater importance is his position on the healing power of mind when motivated by spiritual attitudes. Keep and make a balance in self, as indicated. Not only for that pertaining to the physical and mental, but that purposefulness for which the activities may be. And knowing for what expression there is that purposefulness in thine own spiritual self. For mind is the builder. But unless it be founded in that influence not made by might and power, but by the spirit of truth, of justice, of hope, of patience, of understanding, it may become a stumbling block to the individual. For in the spiritual one lives, moves, and has one's being. And the spirit is willing, and the flesh will follow, will the mental build in that direction that they are kept in accord one with another. Keep thine body fit. Keep thine mind attuned to beauty. Another extract clearly states the bad effects of imaginative forces. The spleen being the destructive organ for the dead red blood corpuscles, also the organ that works with, as it may be termed, the imaginative or the psychic forces of the body. And the body being supersensitive or superpsychic in many respects, finds this portion often gives rise to not only the fears, but also those distresses as affect the vegetative nerve system. Edgar Cayce goes on to explain that the vegetative nerve system controls the digestion and assimilation, as well as elimination through the kidneys. To another person, he said, for, as has been experienced by the body, if there are the feelings of fear or grudges, or of being in the position of being repressed within, either from the mental attitudes or from the greater associations in material relationships, there is little that assimilates properly, even when food values are considered and adhered to. The following extract focuses on the creative power of the mind to build constructive change, 
The subject was a young woman, 24 years old. How can I become less fearful and my subconscious more able to rest? As there is brought more and more the activities of the spiritual self through the action of the physical forces, that is, the creative energy of the subconscious force, this will allow itself to become more and more positive and less and less negative. The following is a clear statement on the power of the mind to heal. The attitude of the entity and those dependencies upon creating sufficient numbers of the energized cells. Not only in the circulation itself, but in the activities of the glandular forces, through the process of the mental relationships of control over the nerve plexus of the body. Aided most. Yea, much more than any administration of medicine. In this regard, the work of radiologist O. Carl Simonton has attracted a great deal of attention from both the medical profession and the public. He and his associates have apparently used imaginative faculties of the mind successfully in treating cancer in a number of patients. Here, the practical results of using the mind to influence the body are very apparent. Step 3. Systematic control of thought. Attitudes are built by continuous daily thought processes. How and where does one begin to restructure, creatively and constructively, such thought processes? Some or all of the following may help you do so. First, select a negative thought process that you would like to get rid of. For example, self-criticism. Sometimes this takes the form of complaining. Begin on the first day of the week. Promise yourself that during your waking hours you will in no way negate yourself or complain about your situation. Be aware of this commitment day by day. Keep checking on yourself. Now, during this same week, every day, make an effort to put into thought, word, and action a thought pattern that you would like to acquire. For example, deliberately try to see something good about each person you meet. And don't stop there. Comment on it to the person and or to someone else. You might at least once during the week follow through to action and send the person a note commenting on the good aspect you have observed in them. A little creative thought and practice in this mental exercise can bring a new perspective. Second, use the following checklist of negative and positive attitudes. Score yourself and get a friend who will be honest to score the same list for you. Compare the two scores. This can give you a place to start accenting positive action. Note that the positive and negative attitudes have been listed under specific endocrine areas of the body. This division is used simply to suggest the storage of memory at the cell level of these gland areas. The energy or force involved in each is the same energy. Each individual chooses to manifest this energy in different patterns of thought, word, and action. It is one energy transformed by individual choice. The third suggestion is a reverie technique designed by Mark Thurston, Director of Enlightenment Services for ARE, that may help you observe and strengthen your constructive attitudes. These attitudes can be measured against a standard of Christ consciousness, the highest ideal, as suggested by the following. Should the Christ consciousness be described as the awareness within the soul, imprinted in pattern on the mind and waiting to be awakened by the will of the soul's oneness with God? Correct. That's the idea exactly. Take a few minutes, three to five, each day to review past experiences in your life that best express your alignment with qualities of the highest pattern you can awaken within your mind. The qualities of that pattern are. Serves others. Sees God in every expression. Obedient to higher law. Joyous. Compassionate. Lives in the present. Forgiving. Patient. Humble. 
These suggestions are presented with the view of stimulating your own creative ideas for designing techniques that fit your situation, your special needs, in beginning to change your attitudes. Give this some thought and begin to work with yourself. Part of you, when stimulated, will cooperate and can draw on help for healing far beyond your present limited range. Then change will begin. Step 4. Use of inspirational reading. The conscious mind. Indeed, all dimensions of the mind. Is busy. It needs to be busy with ideas that awaken the best in you. Give it readings to work with that offer you true inspiration. Many people find the promises of Jesus in chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 of John encouraging. These chapters can be read profitably again and again. They deal rather directly with fear. Edgar Cayce recommended them more frequently than any other Bible passages. He also suggested many other Bible passages, such as Psalms 1, 23, 24, 91, Exodus 19, and Deuteronomy 30. For example, find that upon which it may rely for spiritual enlightenment. These, for this entity, may not be better expressed than in that as may be found in 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. Read this with the knowledge and realization that it is self that is being spoken of as the sources of consciousness, of awareness, of awakening, of promise. The scriptures of every religion offer selections for possible study. Return again to old favorites when you need to, or find new ones. If indeed rebirth exists, some readings may reasonably be expected to have greater appeal than others for a reborn person. The Bhagavad Gita of the Hindus, the poems of the Sufi mystics, and passages from Hermes Trismegistus are all personal favorites of mine. For many, Gibran is always inspiring, as are the great poets. Search out what most appeals to you and use it to set the stage of your mind for new creative attitudes. Step 5. Your dreams will help you observe your real attitudes. Edgar Cayce places great stress on the importance of working with your dreams, especially as they relate to physical health. Dreams, according to Cayce, contain all kinds of unobserved psychic phenomena, including communication with the dead, clairvoyance, telepathy, and precognition. Dreams can help us solve physical, psychological, and financial problems. As in ancient times, we can still, according to K.C., gain spiritual guidance and encouragement from our dreams. The very act of dreaming can be healing, renewing, and revitalizing. One of the most interesting observations to be found in the over a thousand references to dreams in the K.C. data is the statement that the dreams can reveal our inner, real attitudes. In one place, he puts it this way. As to how one in one's mental being may create those conditions that bring about just such physical results. But, even as the visions, dreams, are seen, these continue to be mingled together with both good and bad. Just as such thoughts create and bring about such conditions. Then desist. Either be on one side or the other, and act that as would bring to self that desired. You may find it helpful to start suggesting to yourself, several times before falling asleep, I will remember my dreams when I awaken. Keep a pencil and notebook at your bedside and record them immediately on waking. Go back over your dreams every few days. You will soon begin to understand your attitudes more clearly. At the same time, you may wish to look first at some of the Edgar Cayce data on dreams, then at the excellent material available from many sources. First try the booklet, Dreams, The Language of the Unconscious, a collection of essays. Then read Dreams, Your Magic Mirror, by Elsie Secris. Edgar Cayce 
and third, Edgar Casey on Dreams by Harmon H. Bro. Also, How to Interpret Your Dreams by Mark Thurston, The ARE Dreams Course, and Appendix D. Step 6. Use suggestions for yourself and others just before sleep. A very practical and helpful technique for dealing with fear from various sources, especially those arising from the unconscious, is giving yourself suggestions just before sleep. We have already discussed the use of such suggestions for overcoming fear from a past life. Here are a couple of additional selections dealing with fears of different origin. Why do I fear water so that I do not swim far in water over my depth? This is from a condition that existed in the subconscious in very young childhood. Suggestions to self or forcing of self to overcome such might discharge this from the subconscious. Apparently some traumatic childhood incidents set up this fear. The next one also concerns fear of water. Why does my daughter have such a fear of water and what can I do to eliminate this fear? It may only be eliminated by the suggestions that may be made as the daughter turns to sleep. Make the suggestions as for the usefulness of water in the experience, else we may have a barren body. Charles Thomas K.C., Edgar K.C.'s grandson and my son, is a child psychologist who has worked extensively with sleep suggestion and has encouraged many parents to do so. The following report, from an article by him and Mark Thurston, illustrates the power of such suggestions to change fear patterns. Child 2 is a 12-year-old boy. Among those behaviors which the parents hoped to improve were inner turmoil, difficulty controlling bowels, fighting with brothers, verbal abuse of mother, and general hyperactivity. At the end of the first 28 days his mother wrote. In one week there had been such a vast improvement. I couldn't believe it was the same boy. Now, with the completion of the first 28-day cycle, where he was constantly quarreling and fighting with his brothers, he was avoiding situations. Where his terrible all-consuming temper had been, he seemed reflective. His greatest improvement was in his attitude to me. Previously, he'd come from school, change his clothes and go out to play. Then, when I'd start supper the terrible fights with his brothers would begin. Many an evening ended by my being too ill to eat because of his abuse to me. But now, and I thank God, he comes from school, changes his clothes and talks to me. We will sit and discuss a problem where he will follow me around as he tells me his thoughts or asks what I think. I am once again a part of this child I love. Suggestions used for self or others as sleep approaches should be couched in positive, constructive, helpful terms. No and don't statements only create opposition at the unconscious levels. Positive statements are needed. Use a low conversational tone started before the person is asleep and continuing after he or she falls asleep. Or, if giving yourself suggestions, keep repeating the suggestion until you fall asleep. This technique works for both children and adults. Step 7. Develop a sense of humor. A 35-year-old man once asked Edgar Casey for some help. The following exchange took place. What is the cause of my fear and how may I overcome it? By seeing the ridiculous and yet the funny side of every experience. Knowing and believing in whom ye have trusted, in the Lord. For without that consciousness of the indwelling, little may ever be accomplished. The man persisted. What is the cause of my fear? Self-condemnation. Here guilt is given as the cause of fear. Our attitude toward ourselves, our willingness to forgive ourselves, is essential to healing fear. 
One of the most concrete ways of expressing forgiveness is to smile, chuckle, or laugh at oneself. This does not mean a condoning smirk, a wry agreement with the breaking of a law, but rather the recognition of the ridiculousness of one's actions, the funny side of the situation. Edgar Cayce repeatedly spoke of humor as a virtue, something to be cultivated and worked with daily. He admonished one person, not as one to be long-faced. For, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Enjoy. Do not see the dark side too oft. Turn it over. There's another side to every question. Cultivate in self-humor, wit. Ye enjoy it in others, others enjoy it in thee. But too oft it becomes to thee foolishness. Know that thy Lord, thy God, laughed. Even at the cross. The idea that Jesus smiled and joked even at the crucifixion is mentioned several times in the readings. Humor. May ever become the saving grace. For humor. Or to be able to see the fun, the ridiculous, in the most sacred experiences to many. Is an attribute. Cultivate the ability to see the ridiculous and to retain the ability to laugh. For, no. Only in those that God hath favored is there the ability to laugh, even when clouds of doubt arise, or when every form of disturbance arises. For, remember, the Master smiled. And laughed, oft. Even on the way to Gethsemane. This last quotation deals with laughter in terms of tension, times generally associated with fear. One is reminded of the beautiful times during the war years when a funny, sometimes even vulgar, remark broke great tension and eased the bodies and minds of people gripped in panic, paralyzed by fear. Edgar Cayce noted this virtue in the following comments. Spirit is creative. And while creative influences are about the entity, the greater saving grace of the entity may be said to be its ability to laugh at adversity when others would cry. To be able to make a joke of the most sacred things as well as those that are in the realm of the ridiculous. Yet the entity has within itself the appreciation of humor. Hold to that. Quit being too serious. Laugh it off. The following comments deal directly with fear. Use rather the turmoils and discouragements as a means to keep the wit sharp. And it will be found that creative energies, creative forces, will soon overcome the material turmoils. Know that there must be the ability to laugh under the most straining circumstance. There must be the ability to see the sublime as well as the ridiculous. Do not lose this sense of humor. It will oft be a means for saving many an unseeming situation. From his state of extended perception during the readings, Edgar Cayce saw the great value and seriousness of cultivating a sense of humor. The entity should attempt. Seriously, prayerfully, spiritually. To see even as might be called the ridiculous side of every question. The humor in same. Remember that a good laugh, and arousing even to what might, in some be called hilariousness, is good for the body, physically, mentally, and gives the opportunity for greater mental and spiritual awakening. Be mindful of the little things, but do see the humor, do see the laughable side. Awake to the joy in the earth, even under trial ye give expression of same. How does one develop a sense of humor? Here are a few suggestions, you will think of many others. Start collecting good jokes and funny stories. Be careful not to use ethnic prejudices and put-downs of special groups. Try these stories out, first on those close to you, then on groups. Watch your timing, build suspense and attention. And be careful not to forget the point of the story, which should be related to the conversation or discussion. You may want to collect a file of stories. Read them over now and then. You will discover that you will begin to remember them at the right time. The funny papers, sections on jokes in magazines, for example, Reader's Digest, and books of funny stories are excellent sources. The important point is to be aware, be constantly observant, looking for the story or onkliners that can be adapted to situations around you. 
Look for the funny things, the ridiculous things that happen to you every day. They are happening. You may just not have been observant. As you do this, you will begin to remember past experiences, incidents that as you review them are funny. People will begin to laugh with you, not at you, for their lives are filled with similar incidents that your comments and stories about yourself recall for them. Be careful to be brief, not too long-winded, because the other person is waiting to tell you one. Be more observant of animals, especially people animals. Pets and friendly wild animals. They do some funny things. Remember to make notes on funny incidents. File these with your story collection and review them regularly. Perhaps most important of all is practice. Never with malice, never to put down or call attention to weakness, search out the ridiculous side of every conversation and add your contribution of fun to the occasion. You will relieve a great deal of tension in yourself and others. And you will discover a tool for dealing with your fears that works consistently and beautifully.